You know, there are times that we check our bank account to make sure that we've got a little bit of the resources that we need to be a little secure. We might check the gas in our gas tank before we go on a long trip because we think about we want to have a confidence that we're okay. But our faith comes not in what we possess, but in who He is. We place our faith in Him. And we have our faith because not of what we possess, but who possesses us. He possesses us. And so with that, we have a victory because we look forward. So as we sing Have Faith in God, don't sing Have Faith in God. No, it's Have Faith and look forward to the victory. Let's stand as we sing Have Faith in God. Now, what's going on with Larry Allen Turner? They gave quality of life to cancer. 
Okay, quality of life is not good. Okay, so let's let's remember Larry Allen Turner. Will you do that? Anybody else come to church with a prayer request, a prayer need? Hold your, pull up your hand for a moment. Okay, yes. All right, praying for your family. We should certainly do that. Yes, Jeannie? Did you know Kenny Randolph had surgery on Friday? He had surgery this Friday. Okay. No, he had it. Oh, last Friday. Last Friday. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay, surgery last Friday. Anybody else have a prayer need, a prayer concern? Yes, Jennifer? They're talking about surgery on my end, so we need to be my niece this morning in prayer. All right, we will pray for her. Absolutely. Anyone else? If not, let's go to the Lord and lift these prayer requests to the Lord. Invite God to uh, work in your heart and your life today through all the service, through the message, through the invitation. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to come uh, into church today and worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you for your love for us that's so amazing, for your grace that's sufficient for every need that we have in life. And Lord, we do pray for these many uh, that are going to have surgery, those that just had surgery. We pray, God, that your Holy Spirit will have the freedom to move in our hearts today. That we, as we sing, as we listen, as we open your word, God, that you will speak to our hearts about our relationship and our walk and talk with you. Bless this service in every way. We love you and we praise you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, turn around a moment and say hi to the people behind you. John, Mary, it's good to see you guys this morning. God bless you. All right. Uh, if you have your bulletin, you might take a look in there uh, this evening at 5. Uh, and wait, this is for preschool and children, a pumpkin, pumpkin patch party. And uh, so uh, remember, that's for children and preschoolers. Also, if you're on church council, we have a meeting tomorrow night at 7. Uh, also, on Tuesday, you see the ringers. You're rehearsing again. You do that weekly, don't you? All right, that's great. Also, uh, the men's focus group will meet at 6. Lady, ladies will have their final Bible study uh, Tuesday night at 6.30. And then Wednesday is our youth gathering, gathering in our prayer service. Any other announcements? Oh yes, Team Kid begins this Wednesday at 5 o'clock. All right, so be aware of that. Uh, and so, uh, Steve, I look forward to hearing your special music in just a moment. It's a great song. You'll be blessed by it. All right, let's continue our worship.
come Christians join to sing. Let's stand as we sing.
enter that city. Just raise your hand. He does love you. He loves your family. He loves the whole world. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, to me, the most moving of all three of those parables uh, is the parable of the prodigal son. And I want us to read it this morning. So if you have your Bible open, and we're beginning to read in verse 11. And it says, and he, now who's he? Well, that's Jesus. And Jesus said, a man had two sons. 
The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods the swine were eating and no one was giving anything to him. Verse 17. It says, but when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men or hired servants. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion for him, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been what? Found. The Bible says they began to celebrate. Now this story is, is so true to life that it has literally taken place thousands and thousands of times where a son or daughter goes away and then they come back to the Lord. You know, the story of the prodigal is the story of a boy who left his father's house he went away to a far country, and after a period of time of wandering, he returned home. And in this uh, parable that Jesus painted, he gave us four very clear scenes that we can recognize. Now, the first one I want you to write down, scene one, is what we will call rebellion. As the scene opens, we see a family, a family much like yours, much like mine. It's a home. And in that home, there are two boys, and uh, that, that place is, is such that every, everybody can have their heart's desire fulfilled right there at home. The older son was very faithful to his father. He worked hard. Uh, he, he did his duties. He did everything he was supposed to do. But the younger son, he was a bit different, Jesus said. He did not enjoy doing the things of his father. The boy had everything to satisfy the deepest needs of his life. No doubt it was a beautiful home. He had a loving and kind father who loved him with all of his heart. But the attitude of the boy is expressed in the words when he comes to the father and look at verse 12 in your Bible. And this is what he says. He says, Father, give me the share of the inherit of the of the estate that falls to me. The boy's attitude could be summarized in just two words. What were those two words? Give me. He was saying, give me, give me, give me. That's the backdrop of rebellion in the heart of every one of us. Rebellion. That's the beginning of sin in, in a person's life. That's how it all takes place. When we come to the attitude that we say, give me, I've got it all coming my way. And here is a boy who decided to live independently of his father. He desired to do his own thing, his own way, go his own way. And he came to his father and demanded that the Father give him that which he was entitled to by the laws of inheritance. You see, this boy had heard about a place called the far country. 
Now, he had never been to the far country, but he had heard about it. He had never been there, but he had read about it. He had never been there, but he met some people who had been there, and they told him how wonderful and marvelous was the far country. See, the heart of that boy had already been in the far country for a long time. It was only a matter of time until his body would catch up with his heart. You see, where your heart is, eventually your feet will follow. Now, what is the far country? Well, the far country is, is, is anywhere a man or a woman or a student is away from God. Anytime you are away from God and distant from God, that, my friend, is the far country. You don't, you don't even have to leave home to be in the far country. You can be right there with your family and be distant from God and be in the far country because it's a problem of the heart and not a problem of geography or, or distance. The boy one day gathers everything that he's got together and he gets ready on a particular day. He's getting ready to leave the house of his father and there's not one thought in the heart of this boy about the desires of his daddy about his father. He's oblivious to a teary-eyed and, and, and heavy-hearted dad whose heart was broken because a son did not care and he wanted to leave the restraints of home life. Now notice in the scripture the, the father did nothing to restrain the boy from leaving. He didn't do anything to interfere with, with the son and let the son do what he determined to do. And the point of the parable is this. God will not force you to believe in him. He will not force you to love him. He will not force you to live your life for him. He will not force you to serve him. If you're determined to live your life apart from God, he will let you do that. In fact, if you're determined to ruin your life, he will let you. So here is this boy, scene one. He leaves home, not even looking back, because rebellion was in his heart, and he was headed for the far country. Let's take a look at scene two. Now, scene two, Jesus said, is a scene of revelry. Revelry. Uh, as the boy traveled into the far country... He traveled on a road called the Broadway. The Broadway. Uh, he began to notice that quite a few other people were also traveling on the same road that he was on. In fact, it was, it was a heavily populated highway. And they were all going the same direction. No doubt he saw the neon lights. He saw the glitter and the glamour and the billboards promising a wonderful time in the far country. Did you know there are a lot of people on the road uh, to the far country today? In fact, Jesus spoke about that very road in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13. Jesus said, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. Now, when this young man arrived uh, at the place... The Bible calls the far country. Notice in Luke 15, verse 13, it says that when he got there, he squandered his estate with loose living. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means he went on a spending spree. He began to spend what he had. Everything that he saw in this far country, he wanted. He wanted it. He, he was like a little boy in a candy shop wanting something of everything. And, and you know, when this boy left the far country, he had a lot of money. He had that inheritance. And he was going to change his life and change his lifestyle. And he was going to live just the way that he wanted to. He was going to live it up. He was going to have a, uh, let the good times roll day and night. We're both going to be one great big party. He determined that nothing was necessarily right or wrong. That wrong was whatever made you feel bad. And right was whatever made you feel good. 
and the old-fashioned laws and standards of his old fogey father, they were out for him. He's really into it now. Uh, he, he's looking for a brand new thing, and there was plenty of temptation and sin to go around for all. Now, I'm not going to tell you this morning that he didn't have himself a good time. Because he did. He had a fantastic time. A great time for a season. There will always be a season attached to that. Because you see, the devil is too smart to go fishing without an attractive bait. And, and when, when the devil is determined to hook a victim, he will use the most uh, alluring, attracting, enticing kind of bait to get his hands on. Now here's a question for you this morning, and it will be different for everybody here. What is the devil dangling in front of you this morning? He's going to use the most attractive, enticing, alluring bait. And he'll just put it out there for you. It'll glitter. It'll shine. The boy wasted his substance on riotous living. And what a shame to see a young man blow his life at such an early age. What a shame to see a young lady blow everything that really counts and really matters in her life. Let's go to scene three. You with me so far? Rebellion, then revelry. The third scene that Jesus pictures is one of remorse. Look at Luke 15 and verse 14. It says, now when he had spent everything. Now, I don't know how long it took him to spend everything. I've seen people uh, get some money and they're not very uh, good at saving it and it's gone. They spend it very, very fast. The Bible says the time came when, when in the life of this boy that the money ran out. The bubble burst and he didn't have any money anymore. I mean, the rent came due on his apartment and they kicked him out. The, the car payment came due on the car and they repossessed him. He lost all of his money and when he lost all of his money, guess what? He lost all of his so-called friends because the money ran out. All the things that he had enjoyed up to now began to slip away from him. Let me tell you something. Are you listening? The far country doesn't care anything about you. Let that sink in. The far country doesn't love you. The far country has no real compassion for you. No real companionship. You won't find any understanding or any caring there. All of that came with the father's house. And when he left the father's house, he lost out on that. Because all he found in the far country was heartbreak. And sorrow. And grief. And remorse. He spent all that he had. And then the Bible says a famine moved into that country and he began to be in want. My dear friend, if you choose the road of sin, you will eventually end up in a place of desperate want. Now, it may not be physical want, but it most certainly will be spiritual want and soul want. Listen to me. You are more than just a stomach this morning. And you put food in your stomach. You're more than just a body. And you put clothes on your body. The Bible says you are an eternal soul. That you have an eternal spirit. You're more than just an animal with, with normal animal reflexes. You're more than just a machine that does things in a certain mechanical way. You are a human being made by God. You're created in the image of God, and God loves you, and God likes what He made, and God intends for you to have a fellowship with Him, and believe in Him, and love Him, and worship Him. And I'll tell you something, if you try to live your life apart from God, separate from Him, you will come to a time of desperate soul want. There will be loneliness and emptiness and utter desperation. You know, when the devil, 
wants to get hold of a person. He will not be content until he, he takes that soul down to the very depths of despair and degradation. Verse 15 of our text says, So he went out and hired himself to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Now here is this boy who has been relegated to... Uh, down to the ranks of hogs and he's down there feeding the hogs and the Bible says in verse 16 and he would gladly fill his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating and no one was giving anything to him. I mean, he is desperate at this point. The boy was so hungry he didn't care who ate the pods from the carrot tree whether it was hogs or man and, and that's what sin will do for you. Every one of us this morning, we have a choice. You came to church today because you had a choice to come and you made the right choice. We all have choices and, and you can choose to either be God's son or God's daughter or you can choose to be the devil's hog tender. You can make up your mind to live in the Father's house where there is love and forgiveness and abundance and plenty, or you can determine in your own life, in your own heart, to let the devil rule your life and make an absolute slave out of you. Because sin, my friend, is addictive, and sin will enslave you. Here's a boy who was intended for the Father's house to grow up and be just like his father, loving and kind and good, and there he is in the hog pen with all the slop and all the sin and all the slavery. Scene number four. I love this part of the message. Scene four is the best part. If we didn't have this scene, I wouldn't like this parable very much. But listen to this. The fourth picture is one of return. Look at verse 17 in your Bible. He says, but when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. The Bible says the day came that he came to himself. Do you see the boy? I mean, can you see this boy? He thought that he had everything, but now he discovers that he has nothing, and there he sits in the hog pen with his head in his hands and a vision of his father's house with abundance and plenty. And the young man came to himself and begins to think, you know, I, I don't belong here. Why am I in this place? I don't want to be here. I was made for something better than this. I don't have to be this way. I don't have to live like this. And so the boy, I think, begins to make up a speech. He says, uh, uh, I'm tired of this place. I'm tired of this sin. I'm tired of this slop. I want to go home. I miss my friends back home. I miss my mama's cooking back home. I miss my dad. I miss my bed. I want to go home. And verses 18 and 19 records this. He said, I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. Now get this. What a change. He left the father, journeyed to the far country, and he left saying, give me, give me, give me. He came to himself. His life has changed. He's getting ready to go back home, and now he's saying, make me, make me, make me. What a difference. I mean, let me tell you something. You, you may have taken your life into your own hands, and you said, give me, give it to me. And you have wanted it all your way, and you've taken your life, and perhaps you've made a mess out of it. But if you will come to the point in your life where you're sick and tired of running your own life, 
And you're willing to wait, make your way back to the Father's house and can truthfully say from your heart, Father, make me, make something out of me is glorious what God can make out of a person. Amen? I mean, think about this. It's glorious how God can reach down into the hog pen of sin and take some of the mud and muck and mire and shape it and mold it and remake it and breathe into it the Holy Spirit and make something beautiful out of your life. So the Bible says he turned. He turned away from the husks and the hogs and the hunger. And he said, I'm going home. I'm getting out of this. I'm going home where my dad is. And I think had it been written in our day, he would have said something like this. I've wandered far away from God, but now I'm coming home. The paths of sin too long I've trod. Lord, I'm coming home. Now he just wondered if his daddy would let him come back home. Not every daddy would. Look at verse 20. In verse 20, the first part, it says, So he got up and came to his father. You know, there at the father's house, there was a gate. And every day, his gray-haired daddy would go to the gate and he would look out on that far country road and look for his son. I think every day he went to the gate. And his eyes were beginning to dim and his eyes would pay, play tricks on him and his eyes would fool him again. He would think he would see his son, but it's not his son. And, and now he's disheartened and, and, and disappointed. But there had never been a day that that father didn't go to the gate and look hopefully and expectantly to see his wayward son coming back home. Now let me just say a word this morning. If you're here today and you're lost without Christ, and Jesus does not live in your heart, you don't believe in Him, you've never accepted Him as your Savior, listen to me. There has never been a moment in your life there has never been a breath in your body that the God of heaven did not look down upon you with love for you. Reaching out to your heart, trying to grip your heart. You know, if possible, I believe that daddy would have waited an eternity for his boy to come back home. And one day, he, I can only picture this, he goes out to the gate, and he's looking again as he's looked many, many different days. And off in the distance, he sees a form coming. And, and he, he says, I, I think my eyes are tricking me. I think my eyes are fooling me again. I, I'm not trusting what I'm seeing. But the form got closer and closer and closer. And then he says, my soul. My soul, it is too good to be true. I have prayed for him. I have longed to see him again. I would never forget that face. I would know it anywhere. That's my boy. They saw him. They saw him. Now, folks, my Savior drew this picture. I wouldn't dare attempt to draw this picture. But Jesus Christ, only Jesus, could draw such a bold picture of Jehovah God. For the Bible says in verse 20, if you'll look at it, he says, he got up and ran to his father, came to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion for him, and ran. You see that? And ran and embraced him and kissed him. The Bible says he ran. I mean, what a picture of God running. Did you know the times where God runs? And He's running right here because Jesus drew the picture. Here is the God of the universe running, running to greet this boy coming back home. And the boy had this speech, I'm sure, all planned out in his mind, but he never even gets to finish it because the father smothers his boy with kisses. The prodigal has come home. You know, there was a girl who decided to play the prodigal. I'm close with this story. She decided to play the prodigal and, and she left her mother and her home. 
And she went away into the big city. And for a while she wrote and sent postcards, but then it wasn't long until all the letters stopped. And this mother, she feared greatly for her daughter. The mother, not being able to stand it any longer, made her way to the city. And she looked and looked and looked for her daughter. In desperation, one day she went to a social worker in the city and explained and, and asked for help for her prodigal daughter. And this is what the social worker told her to do. She said, go to a photographer and make 500 copies of yourself. And when you get them, bring them to me. And at the bottom of each one, I will write, darling, come home. But the social worker, she took them to every bar, every nightclub, every hot spot, every house in ill repute in the city. And the mother, she went home to pray and to wait. Several nights later, a wayward, broken, shameful girl walked arm in arm with her lovers and companions and made her way into a bar. She sat down and they were all talking and laughing and she looked over and on the wall there was a picture of her mother. And at the bottom of that picture it said, Darling, come home. By the next morning, this girl was home in the arms of her mother who had never, ever given up on her daughter. Now Jesus Christ, let me tell you what He's done. Jesus has drawn an amazing picture of Jehovah God. And at the bottom of that picture, here's the caption. Prodigal, come home. Come home. Come home. If you've never come to Christ, your decision today is to accept Jesus as your personal Savior. If you've accepted Christ, but you're away from God, then my friend, you're in the far country. And just like the prophet, you can come home today to God. Would you stand with me as we pray? Bow our heads, close our eyes. Father, we pray over this invitation today, praying that your Holy Spirit will quicken and empower and give courage to those who need to decide for Christ accepting Him as their Savior and Lord. Perhaps they're already a Christian, but they've been out in the far country and they need to come home today. The Father is there waiting, running to them to come home. God, help us to turn to come back to You today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. As we begin to sing, I'll be here at the front. If you have a decision to make for Christ, don't worry about what people think. You just come to me and make a decision for Christ. Let's sing together.
a part of today. And uh, Missy, it's good to have you in church. Thank you. We've been praying for you. Thank you. And we love you. I want to say thank you to everyone. Amen. I felt your prayers and they helped. Amen. It's great to be alive with you. Absolutely. God bless you, Missy. And Wanda, you just keep holding her tight. <laughs> All right. We'll keep praying. And uh, have a good day today. Uh, remember the pumpkin patch for all the preschool and children tonight. And uh, if it snows, go outside, stick your tongue out, and catch a snowflake. Okay? You look like kind of silly. No, I mean you. Go out there and get that. To all the guys and girls, we had a whole bunch of girls here today. And you guys are great over there. God bless you. And uh, let's go to the Lord in closing word of prayer. Uh, Brad, would you lead us please my closing prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you for today.